As patron of this wonderful charity, I continue to be amazed by the huge impact which this small organisation has on the people it supports and how much it is able to achieve with the financial investment of supporters like you. The way they are able to change people's lives is astonishing and have done so for thousands and thousands of people over the last 40 years. Prisoners Abroad continues to do as the name suggests. 40 years ago, Prisoners Abroad was co-founded by Joe Parham to support British people who were arrested and detained overseas, and this is still the core of the work we do today. However, scratch the surface, speak to the dedicated team, visit the offices, learn about some of the appalling circumstances our service users are in, and you begin to realise how much more than just supporting prisoners overseas we do. This non-judgmental, unique charity has been committed for 40 years to helping people who are often overlooked by society and it continues to be there for them when they need it the most. The range of emotional and practical support Prisoners Abroad offers across the three services is something that no other organisation can provide. Helping the prisoner abroad by sending money for food, clean water, blankets, and of course, medical care, vitamins, etc. For the families here, while the prisoner is abroad, offering advice, emotional support, and a safe environment for families with the family support groups around the country. And then here, when ex-prisoners are released and back in the UK, offering the essential long-term resettlement support in the UK and the practical help with accommodation, benefits, medical support, etc. There is a significant increase in British citizens who have never lived here, who may have emigrated with their parents as children and have nothing and no family here who are deported back here upon their release and have no one else to turn to. We realise that the trauma of overseas imprisonment does not stop once you are released. And of course, all of this affects many more people than just the one imprisoned. Now, you are all here because you want to help change people's lives and give them the chance to build a positive future and become valuable members of society. We will be asking you to show your support shortly. In a moment, we will watch a short film featuring the voice of Prisoners Abroad co-founder Joe Parham talking about the early days of this organisation, the stories of John, who was imprisoned in Brazil, Tracy, whose son was detained in Dubai, and Desmond, who is here tonight, who we helped to resettle in the UK when he returned from the US. It's with great sadness that we pay tribute to Sir Henry Brooke, who died this week. Henry was a patron of prisoners abroad and a long-standing donor and always used his influence to support our work whenever he could. And valued it is through his introduction that we first met Lord Newbagger when he was master of the rolls. He, Sir Henry, will be greatly missed by all who knew him. Each year at these dinners, we provide you with an interesting speaker. And this year is no exception. We are immensely fortunate this evening to have with us Lord Newberger of Abbotsbury, a most distinguished barrister and judge, and until September of last year, President of the Supreme Court. And we are thrilled that Lord Newberger has become a trustee of prisoners abroad. He has made a major contribution to the judiciary and to access to the professions in this country and to the maintenance of the rule of law, one of the great British contributions to the world. And he demonstrates enormous sensitivity to the important relationship between the law and public opinion. I'm delighted that David is here to speak to us. 
David. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's always a great pleasure and an honor to speak at one of the splendid livery company halls, and the Mercer's Hall is an especially fine example. And speaking in a livery company hall has a special resonance for me. Four years ago, I attended the annual dinner of the Property Litigation Association in the Fishmongers Hall. As I was president of the association, I had to give a speech. I was somewhat strapped for topics until I dimly recollected, thanks to my previous career as a property law barrister, that the Fishmongers Company had been involved in a number of property cases many years ago. Going to the library, I duly found a three slightly obscure 19th century cases in which the fishmongers had been involved, and I wove a speech around those cases. At the end of the speech, there was the usual clapping, and as I started to leave, the usual thanks and congratulations. So feeling chuffed and a bit relieved, I made my way out of the hall. As I was doing so, I saw my daughter, Jessica, a property litigator. She caught my eye, and I knew at once from her slightly malicious smile that something was wrong. I went up to her. That went okay, didn't it, I said. It was rather clever of me to find those fishmonger cases, wasn't it? She replied, hasn't anyone told you this is the Anmongers Hall? <laughs> That, 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 that experience established four things for me. First, check the invitation before you speak. Secondly, however much clapping and praise and thanks follow a speech, don't be fooled. Thirdly, always have a skeptical relation around to keep your feet on the ground. And finally, as I left the hall, if you don't laugh, you cry. So always try and see the funny side. Well, as a result of this experience, in terms of location, talking to you in a livery company hall is a pleasure and an honor, but especially when that hall is in Anmunga Lane, it's tinged with considerable diffidence. <laughs> but in terms of subject matter, speaking to you about prisoners abroad on its 40th anniversary dinner is a pleasure and an honor which is wholly free of diffidence. I first heard of the charity when I was a judge, and I immediately realized that it was an exceptional organization performing an extremely important and worthwhile role, filling a gap whose existence would otherwise be seen as a severe moral blot, blot on the standing and reputation of our society. On my recent retirement as a judge, a fair number of openings presented themselves, many of which I declined, but the first offer which I resolved to accept was to become a trustee of Prisoners Abroad. It's a unique charity with a unique function. No other institution, governmental, quasi-governmental, third sector or charitable, has a role which significantly overlaps or duplicates that of Prisoners Abroad. Without the, without the intervention of Prisoners Abroad, British people in foreign prisons would get practically no support, or simply no support, their families would get no help over and above normal welfare benefits, and the prisoners would get no reception when they returned to this country. Regrettably, of course, conditions in some British prisons give us cause for embarrassment today, but it's only fair, if somewhat depressing, to record that in this connection we are much better than many countries in the world and better than most. Prisoners in this country are not incarcerated in disgusting conditions with no toilet facilities. They do not have inadequate and disgusting food. They do not find that essential, let alone life-saving, medical treatment is withheld. They are not denied the opportunity to write to and receive letters from their families. Yet that, of course, is the fate of many prisoners in so many other countries. And then when they are released, prisoners are sent back to the UK, often with no one to meet them, with nothing other than their clothes, wholly inappropriate for our weather. There is a formidable problem with an increasing number of return returnees, many of whom, although technically British, have had nothing to do with the UK for decades since they were tiny children 
met one this evening who uh, left this country when he was six months old, but was technically British and was therefore returned to this country without the faintest idea of what that involved. And all this is why prisoners abroad matters. The charity's devoted staff ensure as far as they can the British prisoners in foreign prisons are treated in a civilised fashion so far as conditions, food and health care are concerned, that they're kept in touch with their families, provided with some reading matter, and that someone is there to receive them, help them and point them in the right direction uh, when they return to the UK. And even in countries where prison conditions are civilised, the involvement of prisoners abroad can obviously help ensure that British prisoners do not feel abandoned or cut off from their families, and their families do not feel cut off from them. Of course, there's a very limited amount that can be done in some countries, but even if the effect of the efforts are slight, the very fact that a prisoner realises that he or she is not forgotten must be worth a lot. Hence, of course, the postcards which you've, we've all been invited uh, to write this evening. And when they return to the UK, the assistance given by prisoners abroad does not just benefit the returning prisoner in terms of improving prospects of rehabilitation. It also helps society because, because it makes less likely that somebody who has offended in the past um, will uh, re-offend. But of course, many of these prisoners who are being helped have not even been convicted of any offence. Uh, indeed, some of them will never even be found guilty of any crime. And some, as even happens in our system, but is more likely to happen in systems in many country, other countries, will have been found guilty of crimes which they hadn't committed. Prisoners who are held on remand, as happens in more serious countries in this, cases in this country, i.e. people held in prison awaiting trial, often in disgraceful conditions that I've been describing, can take an unconscionable time for their cases to come to court. Surely everyone would agree that prisoners on remand, those who are never tried, those who might be acquitted, deserve the support which prisoners abroad gives. But any society which wishes to be considered to be civilised has a duty to treat prisoners who've been convicted as human beings, even those who've been rightly convicted of horrible crimes. And of course, even then, there is also their families who've committed no crime. More than a century ago, when he was Home Secretary, Winston Churchill said in the House of Commons that a calm and dispassionate recognition of the rights of the accused against the state, and even of convicted criminals against the state, and a desire to rehabilitate all those who paid their dues in the hard coinage of punishment, were things which mark and measure the stored up strength of a nation, and are the sign and proof of living virtue in it. If that's true of people who've committed crimes in this country, it is surely all the more true of people who've committed crimes abroad, and even more true, of course, of those who have been incarcerated abroad who have committed no crimes. Our duty to help and to rehabilitate, to give effect to what Churchill described in the same speech as the unaltering faith that there is a treasure, if you can only find it, in the heart of every man, is at least as great for Britons who've committed no crime here as it is for Britons who have committed uh, crimes abroad. You will shortly be able to hear some details and watch some memorable examples of the achievements of prisoners abroad. I think that what you watch and what you hear will enable you to appreciate that those achievements embody what Churchill called the stored up strength of the British nation. Of course, most of you, like me, will already be aware and supportive of what prisoners abroad does. But, of course, it's true that it never does any harm to be reminded of the real, hard, often shocking situations in which people find themselves when they are, sometimes through no fault of their own, on the wrong side of the law abroad. There is no substitute for seeing the faces and hearing the stories of people who've been helped, even saved, by the dedicated efforts of those who work for the prisoners, for prisoners abroad. You can not only watch the videos and listen to a description of the achievements, you can visit the offices, offices of prisoners abroad in Finsbury Park. It's a very worthwhile experience. Under the inspired leadership of Pauline Crow, 
the dedicated, intelligent, and friendly workers can be seen hard at work, helping prisoners all over the world, helping their families, aiding them on being returned to this country, organizing things, planning, and dealing with finance. They will normally be able to find time to talk to you, and at least if your experience is like mine, you will be very impressed and very interested. As you've heard, Pauline cannot be here this evening owing to a freak accident, but in her indomitable and selfless way, she's not only made sure that I get all my facts right, she's been very anxious that on this 40th anniversary, uh, uh, it is right to remember those who've already been mentioned, and indeed we've seen uh, one of them this evening, those who established prisoners abroad. Craig Fian, Chris Cheel, alas, neither of them no longer with us, Joe Parham, whom we saw, and the first chairman, David Bernstein. Precisely uh, what she said about them uh, 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 it was that we would not exist without them and their selfless efforts. Precisely the same, we would not, prisoners abroad would not exist without them and their selfless efforts, can be said about the present team of workers. What they achieve with a budget of around 1.7 million pounds is astonishing. In 2017, prisoners abroad supported 1,700 prisoners detained in 100 different countries almost 2,000 family members in the United Kingdom, and about 350 ex-offenders in the UK through the resettlement service. As I've mentioned, uh, the numbers, uh, particularly of the deportees who come back here, has increased significantly over the last year, putting increased pressures on our resources, not least because it's led to the need to build the new resettlement unit in Finsbury Park in order to cope. Given that this annual expenditure benefits so very many people in serious need without any other source of assistance, and given that it's around a third of the average pay of a single FTSE company chief executive, it would be a very sad comment on our society if the £1.7 million could not be found. Winston Churchill's unfaltering faith would have faltered. I hope that you will conclude that prisoners abroad deserves all the support that you and other decent people can give. Thank you very much. <laughs>